Hello there, and welcome to video number two of Macro Fossils. There was a lot of course stuff to cover in the last one, so sorry about that, but I hope that the history of paleontology was interesting. Um, and now we're moving on to some of the biology that you need to kind of as background for the rest of this course. And there are three reasons why I think that's really good to include. Number one, just because it's really interesting. I think that's it's well worth focusing on those bits of the our science, which are just really fascinating. Obviously, all of it is, but um, I find it then hard not to include it in this lecture course. The second part is because some of the biology that we'll cover will help you understand these organisms better, help you learn about them, and will help you communicate effectively with other, say, biologists, paleontologists, or geologists when it comes to talking about these organisms. The third reason is because actually you need some kind of a framework to help you understand these organisms and how, for example, um, how they can help us. And one of those frameworks and one that works well for me, so I've included it in that lecture, is how they relate to each other. I find it far easier to say, remember what a trilobite is by thinking what it relates to. So for each of these organism groups that we're going to be looking at over the forthcoming lectures, I'll be telling you where they are in the tree of life. So I'll be introducing that and its kind of associated concepts over the course of this video. So without further ado, let's look at some background biology and let's start off by um, talking about how we can identify and communicate different parts of an animal. Here is an animal. This is a member of an extinct group called the trilobites we're going to be learning about in the next video. Next video, sorry, in fact, the next lecture, so the next website for this course. This was um, this is a fantastic drawing by a German gentleman called Ernst Heckel. And on this, I've labelled a lot of anatomical directions for you. Now, these are really important because they help us make sure that we're referring to the same things when we're talking about different organisms. A really good example of why we need this is because if you think about humans, humans are upright, right? There we go. Whereas we've evolved from something that was probably like this. Um, those That change in position may um, change the name that we uh, call different anatomical directions if we're purely talking about functional um, categories. However, by thinking about these things in a slightly deeper sense, we can actually have a useful framework to communicate uh, directions on a creature. So on this type trilobite, you can see I've labeled a number of different bits. The first thing that you may want to have a quick look at and consider is anterior and posterior. We use the anterior to describe the front of an organism. In a bilaterally symmetrical organism, this will usually be where its eyes and its mouth and other sensory organs are located on some form of a head. The posterior will often be where something like a tail is, um, is uh, located. So that's anterior front and posterior back. You can see on this image on the right hand side here that I've actually labeled two other surfaces, the dorsal and the ventral surface. So the dorsal surface is the top surface of a creature, which we may think of um, as a dorsal view when we're looking from above that organism. The underside of a creature is often called its ventral surface. So ventral. So dorsal view and ventral view of a trilobite. On this ventral view, I've also marked um, medial or axial. So these words can largely be used interchangeably in a number of groups, though not all of them. Um, this means towards the middle of a creature when you're looking at it either from above or from below. And to either side of that, um, we call lateral. So for example, the legs, which you can see here, are lateral to this axial bit of the organism. For any individual thing that sticks out of an animal, such as the leg that I've highlighted here, we can talk about proximal, close to, through to distal, far away from. So these are all a number of different axes that help you understand um, kind of like the different anatomy and relationships, spatial relationships of an organism. So when I was drawing this diagram, I was thinking, well, how do I um, remember these uh, 
different orientations whenever I'm trying to think about them. So I provide for you as an alternative to this magnificent trilobite, this magnificent French bulldog wearing a life jacket. So on this French bulldog, you can think of the anterior, uh, the front as uh, where its head and its kind of squashed nose is. Its posterior is where its uh, semi-tail is and its uh, um, back legs. The dorsal surface is where the handle for this life jacket is situated, and the ventral surface is its belly just here. Uh, someone on Twitter informed me that actually for uh, dogs, people tend to talk about caudal and rostral rather than anterior and posterior, but there you go. So if that helps you remember those directions, think about the French Bulldog wearing a life jacket. So bear in mind that you may be sitting here being like, yeah, Russell, this is really simple. Come on move on to something more interesting. That may be true in many vertebrates, but it can become increasingly tricky in organisms that don't follow the same body plan. And indeed, I've put a uh, quiz just below this video on the webpage that will help you um, come to that realization, I suspect, when I ask you about the, uh, those directions in a group, range of different groups of animals. But the reason really why it's so difficult for this uh, to, to kind of um, to, to expand this across all groups of organism is because when everything starts off, uh, it starts as an embryo, a ball of cells. So in that context, what does anterior or posterior really mean in a ball of cells? So I got into a whole reading loop when I was writing this lecture slide about this because it's really, really interesting. So I just wanted to put a single slide on it to actually um, to highlight some of the uh, some of the, the kind of the things that we may want to consider when we're thinking about anterior, posterior, dorsal, ventral, and organism. And here on this slide, you can see the early stages of an embryo forming. forming. So you start off with a ball of cells shown here at the top. That eventually becomes a hollow sphere of cells. This is the next stage in embryonic development. And it's in this um, ball of cells, this hollow sphere, I should say, of cells, at the stage of development where there is lots of activity and some of this activity leads to the formations of those axes that we've just been talking about. Exactly when this happened, interestingly, depends on the group. Um, so in some groups, it's actually really early. There is, there is apparently some evidence in some groups that within the egg, there is an anterior to posterior axis, whereas in other organisms, including mammals, um, it's not quite that early. Exactly how anterior and posterior are differentiated in embryo relies on morphogens. So these are substances which have a non-uniform distribution and that non-uniform distribution then governs the pattern of tissue development. And those morphogens are responsible early on in embryo's life for defining the axes. In fact, anterior posterior is one of the earliest axes to form. So this hollow ball of cells that you can see here, then transforms into a multi-layer structure, which you can see here, um, and starts to differentiate into different cell types, different uh, layers of tissues. There is a stage shown on the far right here at which there is one hole in the embryo. It's a thing, if you're interested, but you don't need to know, called the blaster pore. And what this hole goes on to form in the adult of, and in fact in the juvenile, uh, the non-embryonic form of this embryo um, is actually one of the main major defining characteristics of, in the animal tree of life, which brings us on to the next slide. So for every group of animals that we look at, we'll be placing them on the tree that you can see on this slide here. So as I mentioned, this is to help provide context to help you learn about these organisms. I, I thought I would start though by give, having a quick whiz through the different groups of animals that are shown on this tree to make sure that we're, we're all on the same page. So with that in mind, at the top here, you can see the periphera. Those are sponges. Then below that, we have the cnidarians. So these are um, corals and jellyfish and relatives. And Below that, we have the echinoderms. So these are sea urchins and starfish and close relatives. The next group is the hemichordates. Now these are creatures that we're not gonna see that much of over the, uh, this lecture course, though we will touch upon them. Uh, these include the acorn worms, if of interest. Um, 
And then there are the chordates. These are creatures with backbones and close relatives. So hey, we're chordates. Good times. We have the mollusks. So um, slugs and snails are mollusks, and there are still many representatives of this group of animals that live within the live in the sea. There are segmented worms called annelids on this tree. The most familiar annelid uh, to us uh, uh, as organisms that live on land are probably the earthworms, if you want an example of an annelid. And there are some cool um, uh, colonial creatures called the bryozoa, which we're not going to cover in great detail over this course, but it's important to know that those creatures exist. There are brachiopods, going to have an entire lecture on those, so you're going to learn lots about brachiopods. And there are kind of creepy crawlies, things with um, segmented uh, joints and exoskeletons, a grouping called the arthropods. There are onocophrons. These are a group of legged worms that are entirely terrestrial, so they only live on land, um, which are really cool, but we're not going to feature them um, because they don't have much of a fossil record, I'm afraid. And finally, there are on this tree the priapulids. So these, are, this is a group of worms. Um, that's obviously a heavily trimmed tree. That doesn't involve all of the animals that there are, or all of the major groupings of animals that there are. But for our purposes, it features all of the major groups of animals that we're going to be covering over this course. So I hope that's some useful background to the animals that are on those trees. So now we can move on to thinking more kind of widely about what an evolutionary um, tree actually is. So there's a word for that, and that's a phylogeny. So a phylogeny is just a tree of relationships. And a phylogeny is made up of clades. You may remember these words from Rob Sansom's teaching last year. On this tree, you can see a number of clades. A clade is a group of organisms that's more closely related to everything else within that group than everything else on this tree, i.e. they share a common ancestor. So to choose an example on here, the arthropods and the onocophrons share a common ancestor um, that is more closely related to either of those two groups than it is to the um, priapulids. So that's what a clade is. And there are a number of clades on this tree. Um, all of the clades, I mean, every single um, point where you have a split on this tree, such as the one that you see here, represents a clade. And I've labeled a number of them on this tree for you. So any creature that has a through gut with bilateral symmetry is a member of a clade called the bilaterians. And you can see that within the bilaterians, I've labeled two major clades here, the deuterostomes and the protostomes. Um, so these are actually defined in part by what that first hole in the embryo that we just discussed in the last slide becomes. In chordates, echinoderms, and other deuterostomes, that first hole becomes the anus. In the protostomes, that first hole becomes the mouth. So that's one of the features that define those groups. Um, and that's how they're related to each other. And this is the animal tree of life. Animals are often called metazoans. So uh, a particular grouping of animals, <clears throat> you can see I've marked here, called the eumetazoa. That is a phylogeny. That's how things are related to each other. Um, taxonomy, which is shown on the right hand side here, is a way of organizing things. So you'll have seen this diagram um, in Rob's lectures for many of the different groups of animals that he covered in the history of life on Earth. And remember that taxonomy is just a way of organizing things that doesn't always, but it often does, represent evolutionary history. So the reptiles are a really cool example. Um, they may be a taxonomic grouping, but they don't form a clade because other groupings have evolved from within the, um, the reptiles. So reptile is this kind of catch-all function that's sorry, capsule description that's very functional for us, is useful to use, but it doesn't represent uh, an evolutionarily true grouping, we might say, a clade. So in terms of taxonomy, there are lots of different levels into which we um, categorize organisms. You may remember this as the Linnaean taxonomy, including the kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. So for every group that we see, I'm going to introduce both how they're related to other things and where they fit into that Linnaean taxonomy. But remember, these are subtly different things. So I wanted to finish this lecture by highlighting how um, fossils can help us as geologists and why that is. Now, one of the ways that um, uh, fossils help us is because of extinctions. 
Uh, you learned in passing about mass extinctions in year one, but we have extinctions occurring on different scales all of the time. Wherever there is a formal t turnover, this is an, a, another word for an extinction, where a change in the, um, the fossils that we found in a rock, we can identify that in the rock units as long as there are fossils preserved. And of course, if you look at this diagram on the left here, you can see that we have different groups of animals organized in this case into different um, kind of uh, collections of creatures um, as we go through geological time. So early on, we get this kind of very characteristic Cambrian collection of creatures that's re replaced by a very characteristic collection of animals in the Paleozoic, and that's replaced by a, a modern fauna. So um, this is why fossils are really useful in helping us to untangle time in the rock record. As we will learn about next lecture, fossils are key to building up the geological column at all levels, both in terms of the, um, the changing uh, landscape of the changing creatures that are alive at any given time period, but also as shown in the diagram on the right here, through these turnover events where we suddenly see a change. I, it's no coincidence that many of the divisions between our time periods are marked by an extinction because those time periods are defined on the basis of the fossils um, within these rocks. So over the course of this unit, we'll be introducing um, this approach to using fossils to date rocks, something called biostratigraphy in a bit more detail for you. So extinctions help us um, age rocks, essentially. Extinctions and the effect they have on fossils, I suppose I should say. So that's one reason fossils are useful to us as geologists. They provide the concept of time. But fossils also provide us with environmental information. They are very useful in, for example, the extraction industries uh, where people are looking for, say, oil, um, to help us understand where those, in what environments those rocks were deposited. And the same is true for um, many other industries as well, including uh, research, for example. So fossils are key to identifying the origins of sedimentary rocks. Fossils can indeed be integral to being able to tell the origin of any given uh, unit of rock. So um, you can see an example here of cross stratified sands. These could be fluvial, tidal, or aeolian. And in fact, these three represent all three of those potential um, depositional environments. So river, as uh, marine, or as part of a desert. And I put a little F-A-N-T on there to help you identify which. If you find a rock, say with a marine bivalve in it, it's highly unlikely to be either a river deposited rock or a desert. If you find a, a um, fossil of an organism that we know only lived in fresh water, then it's not going to be uh, a marine organism and it's not going to be also a marine rock and it's not going to be one that was deposited in a desert. Mudstones are, for example, notorious for providing little environmental information. They're often deep marine, but they can also be overbank or delta deposits. The fossils will help you say which one of those environmental um, conditions the rock was deposited on if there are fossils in that rock. They can also tell you about the firmness of the substrate at the point at which the rock was deposited, the rates at which of sedimentation at which, of which that rock was laid down, the paleo latitude and climate of that rock and the depth of deposition and much more. So we'll touch, be touching on this over the course of our lectures as well. I wanted to finish by um, highlighting that fossils um, are biological remnants, yes, but they're also subject to geological forces. And fossil preservation is very important. This is a thing called taphonomy, which we'll be spending all of the next video talking about. The important thing I want you to take away from this particular slide is that biases exist in fossilization. Hard parts generally preserve and soft parts don't. This matters for us as geologists um, 
less, I suppose, than those who are studying eco ancient ecosystems to try and work out what was there, but it is still worth noting. And the example I've put here, um, I think is a really nice one. So this was a, um, a study by George Staff and colleagues who probed the paleoecological significance of the taphonomy of a variety of different nearshore communities sampled over a number of years. So these are communities of organisms living within a um, environment. Most animals in living communities, this study showed, are not usually preserved. But the majority of animals with preservation potential, i.e. those that are likely to be preserved, are in fact fossilized. So more of these were found, these creatures with hard parts were found in death assemblages than in living assemblages. A death assemblage is just a collection of organisms found in different place and position that they occupied in life. So the effects of time averaging on what is left in the rock record are clearly significant. And in this case, these organisms that survived tended to be suspension feeders or creatures that actually lived in the sediment. These were most likely to be preserved and thus they modified the signal that we see in the rock record of their ecology. Again, as geologists, as long as there is something there to help us identify what environment that was, this matters less than if we're trying to understand whether everything was, say, a filter feeder during a particular time feeder. But it's still important to remember that when we're looking at what's in a rock, this does not equal what was alive at the time that that rock was deposited. It's just those things that are more likely to preserve. Why that is, we'll cover in the next video.